that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. reading from the Acts of the Apostles. 
But filled with the Holy Spirit, Stephen gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When Stephen had said this, he died. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for this morning is a portion of Psalm 31. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Incline your ear to me. Incline your ear to me. Make haste to deliver me. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe. For you are my crag and my stronghold. For the sake of your name, Lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net they have secretly set for me. For you are my power of strength. Into your hands I commend my spirit. For you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face to shine upon your servant and in your loving kindness, save me. A reading from the first letter of Peter. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, see, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. In order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. Christ. Jesus told his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. For the past several weeks, at least, my, some of my comrades from the First City Troop have been called up to um, regular active duty service in the National Guard, just a handful of them, uh, but still a few who, are, who have had their lives further disrupted and, and uh, uh, been called to full-time service in the Guard these days. They uh, are wearing camouflage, as they usually do when they um, are fulfilling their guardsman's service, and they're wearing masks, I'm sure, to keep one another safe. I, I doubt very much that they're carrying weapons for this particular duty. The duty that they've been called upon to fulfill uh, is called, without any military euphemism whatsoever, a Mortuary Affairs Support Mission. And there are members of the Pennsylvania National Guard, some of them First City Troopers, who have been called upon to help to transport the bodies of the dead in the five counties around Philadelphia during this time of pandemic, when so many lives have been lost. By the end of today, I'm quite certain, 80, more than 80,000 people will have died in this nation from the coronavirus, more than 300,000 around the world in these past four months, five months. Those are the ones we can count, we keep track of at least. And it's quite astonishing to think about these numbers. Much of the passage that we just heard from the 14th chapter of John's Gospel is often read at funerals, but these days there are not a lot of regular funerals taking place, or if they are, they're taking place with only a few people in attendance, because it's not safe for all those who wish to honor the dead to gather and do so because of the pandemic, because of the virus, in some case the very virus that killed those people. Of course there are people dying of other causes as well. And their funerals, too, have been curtailed or shrunk, if they've happened at all. At St. Mark's, when we have funerals, we pay special attention to the remains of the dead, whether, they're a whether it's a body 
or ashes. It's our custom at St. Mark's that there's a body present for a funeral to greet the body at the door using the old rites, whether or not there's anyone here other than me, the verger, and the funeral director. We still stand there in reverent solemnity and say the prayers as we receive the body into the church and vest the casket with the pall in a golden array. And at the end of a funeral, if there's a body present, we are careful and deliberate to make sure that we don't just go to the door of the church, we go outside with the casket onto the street. We accompany that casket on its final steps as it's placed into the hearse and we sprinkle it with holy water. We sense it with incense and we say the Magnificat and final prayers, taking the last steps that we can to care for the bodies of the dead as long as they're in our care. If there are ashes, when we receive them here in the church, we try to treat those ashes with dignity and reverence, whether they arrive in a plastic box, as is often the case, or a mahogany one. No matter who they belong to, the ashes, the boxes of those ashes are vested again with a silken pall of white and gold, reminding us of the baptismal garment into which the dead was received into the household of Christ whenever he or she was baptized. I think of the clergy at these times of my own role in times like that as an usher for the dead, someone whose job it is to do what I can to guide the body from this place to that place. It's not much at that point, but it's what we can do. And we're careful and deliberate to take those actions here at St. Mark's. But these days, of course, the church's ministry to the dead is, as I said, greatly curtailed, miniaturized, shrunk, if it's taking place at all. There are those who have died in this parish community whose remains are waiting for their funeral since they happened in the midst of this pandemic. These days the church can't fulfill this ministry. The clergy can't always fulfill the ministry that we wish we could or that we should be fulfilling. And so the National Guard is fulfilling that ministry as ushers for the dead. We're struggling, I think, in this nation to honestly acknowledge the global tragedy of this pandemic and the death toll that is the result of it. It's difficult for us to acknowledge the truth of what's going on around us. And I'm not entirely sure I know why that is. There are some reasons I comprehend, others I don't. Even with 30 million people unemployed in the last six weeks, it's difficult for us to make the adjustments that we need to make in our own thinking in the midst of this plague. We're good at keeping the we're good at keeping death at arm's length in this nation. We've gotten very good at that over the past centuries, the past century or two, especially since the Industrial Revolution. And it's astonishing, really, that even in the midst of a plague, when refrigerated trucks have to be brought in to, how, to hold the bodies of the dead while they wait to be processed, maybe while they wait for the National Guard to come and pick them up. Even now, even in the midst of this, it's hard for us to be honest and to tell the truth about the dead, to accept that death is so near to us, and to accept the scale of the death that's taking place around us. At her best, the church knows better than this, especially when we're reminded, as we are in, the, in this passage from John's Gospel, that if I go to prepare a place for you, I do so, so that where I am, you may be also. 
Jesus says, where I am, you may be also. Like many of you, I prefer the King James Version of John 14. I prefer especially his poetic language. In my father's house, there are many mansions. I've always fantasized about what that passage means, and I've talked about this at many funerals as well. I fantasize that what it means to say that in my father's house there are many mansions, it really means that, of course, that Christ's love is a commodious love and God's heaven is a commodious heaven and there's room for everyone. I've always enjoyed remembering the particularities of people at their funerals, are there professional particularities or their uh, personal interests, and imagining that in the many mansions of God's house, there's something to keep that person occupied in heaven, and enjoying the heavenly realms as they go about their business as an architect or a lawyer, or read their books or make their music, whatever it is. I've imagined that the, in the many mansions of God's house, it means that there's space for the various interests, affinities, quirks, families, associations, pastimes that all of us have so that we can find ourselves in, a, in an agreeable and jovial place in the many mansions of God's house where we'll be spending eternity and where after all we hope things will be, will be, will be pleasant for us. It's made sense to me that this is Jesus' poetic way of saying, yes, there's room, ample room, for the commodious love of God in his generous household. Ample room for you to find happiness and joy in the fields of eternity. That's how I've generally interpreted this lovely and poetic passage. But it's possible, and in these days I've been thinking of this passage in a different way, it's possible that Jesus means something different by that. It's possible that in the mansions of God's house, or maybe in a gatehouse to the mansions, that seems more likely to me. Or maybe in an undercroft, seems likely to me as well. It seems that possible that in the many mansions at the gatehouse or undercroft of God's house, there might be a designated space a designated space that is assigned for mortuary affairs support missions and where a corps of angels has been detached to tend to the work and mission of the mortuary affairs support mission. These wouldn't be angels under Michael's command. Those angels would be armed, I'm sure, and they're not the angels under Gabriel's command who are involved in communications and busy going off to bring their messages to and fro and need to be swift of wing and fleet of foot. So maybe these are angels under the command of Uriel or Raphael. I'm not sure which. And they may or may not wear camouflage, probably not. What's the point if you're an angel wearing camouflage? If you're an angel, you want everyone to see your wings, I think. In the Mortuary Support Affairs Unit, in the gatehouse or the undercroft or somewhere in the mansions, the many mansions of God's house, these angels carry out sophisticated services, a series of reversals, I imagine. They reverse, they carry out reverse cremation, for instance. I can't imagine how that's done, but Someone in heaven must do it. They carry out reverse decom decomposition. Can't imagine how that's done either. What the chemistry and the science is. Whatever chemistry and science looks like in heaven. But they must do it. They carry out reverse embalming. That science is a little easier for me to imagine. I also imagine that the the angels who carry out the mortuary support affairs mission in the gatehouses or undercrofts of the mansions of God's house in heaven have special skills that they have refined 
for this work and ministry. Skills so that they can repair the scar tissue in the lungs of those who died for COVID-19. Skills so that they can restore congested hearts, for instance. Repair wounds of all kinds. Skills that allow them to carry out transfusions of whatever new lifeblood it is that needs to fill our veins when we are set to take up our lives in the eternal fields of heaven. Maybe it's in this mortuary support affairs detail where Christ's promise to do whatever it is we ask of him is finally carried out. It's a promise that perplexes me otherwise tell you the truth, because it seems so plain that the promise is not being fulfilled here in our own lives, on this side of the grave. But maybe, maybe it's there, amongst the ministrations of the angels in the mortuary support affairs unit in the mansions of heaven, that Christ's promise to do whatever it is we ask in his name is finally filled out. Maybe it's there that therapies are applied to the injuries that we ask Jesus to heal in this life, but which dogged us our whole life long. Maybe it's there that message, that memos are written and sent to the appropriate parties to begin to address cruelties that we visited upon one another so that we can begin to right the wrongs that we've done to one another and make amends for those cruelties. Maybe it's there in the Mortuary Support Affairs Department that the sins for which we've been forgiven in this life, but never really let go of. You know what I mean. Maybe it's there that those sins that we carry around with us finally begin to fade as Jesus fulfills his promise to do whatever it is we ask in his name. Just these past few months, 80,000 of our brothers and sisters have died, along with countless others, of the coronavirus. 300,000, if we count those around the globe, surely there are more. We know there are more than that. And we, whether it's because we're being forced to by the strange restrictions of pandemic, or whether it's because we've become so expert at keeping death at arm's length, we find it difficult to bring ourselves into the presence of all this death. Difficult even to mourn properly, I suppose. I know that there remain lives to be saved in the midst of this pandemic. I know that there is an economy to salvage, and I promise you that I know that we all need haircuts. There's more to focus on than just the death, but there do remain the dead to be considered in the midst of this plague. And the church has been prevented in so many ways from doing what we should be doing, what we want to be doing. Many of us have been prevented from paying attention to the dead as we believe they ought to be paid attention to. And even if we're prepared to do that, we have, as Americans, become expert at keeping the dead at arm's length. As we hear God's assurance of the many mansions that await us in our Father's house, thank God that there are angels who have been assigned to the mortuary support affairs detail. And some of them are wearing camouflage. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
and for the salvation of our souls. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Daniel, our bishop, and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Donald, our president, for the members of the Congress and the courts, for Tom, our governor, and Jim, our mayor, for all those in positions of authority and public trust, and for the leaders of all the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this city of Philadelphia, and for every city and community, and for those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, and for the sick and the suffering, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who are sick with the coronavirus and all who are recovering, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For doctors, nurses, other medical professions, and all those who work in hospitals and in ambulances, and to provide care for those who are sick during this time of pandemic, for their safety and protection, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the unemployed who are worried about their lives, their families, their well-beings, their, their, their careers and their futures, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For John, for Tim, and for all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, and for all the departed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those who have died from the coronavirus in the past day, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That we may end our lives in faith and hope, without suffering and without reproach, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. In the communion of the ever-blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, of blessed Mark the Evangelist, and of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. To you, O Lord our God. Let us now confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And, and also with you. Good morning to you all who are praying with us um, through this live stream service. Um, it's wonderful that you're praying with us and we're so grateful uh, to you for being here to offer your prayers and to join in the worship of God. And I, I hope that um, we'll be worshiping together again soon. We miss you. Uh, and it seems like a worthwhile to sit, thing to say it week in and week out. We miss you. And um, uh, I know there's a lot, of us, a lot of us are missing many people at this time. And we look forward to being united Again, the, uh, I have a few announcements to share with you, even though we are at a distance from one another. The first is to remind you that parish elections are coming up. There is a list, a draft list of um, 
of eligible voters of the parish. I know there are mistakes on it. Uh, I know there are people whose names ought to be on it that uh, aren't on it yet. And if you see that you think your name should be there and it isn't, please let me know. I'm pretty sure there are probably names of people who can't figure out why their names are on it because you don't think you belong on it. You might be right, I might be wrong. Let me know if you have a question about that and we'll go over the, um, the eligibility requirements for voting and we'll see whether or not you, um, your name ought to be on there. If it's not or if uh, it's on there and shouldn't be, we can make that adjustment too. Uh, voter fraud has not been a big problem at St. Mark's, so we're not overly worried about that. I want to remind you of the St. Mark's Scrolls project that um, is ongoing during these weeks of pandemic. I know a lot of people have a lot to do, but sometimes we find ourselves not knowing what to do. And um, being involved in this project is a great way to focus your mind and your prayers. It's surprising. You think, oh, it sounds like a chore. And then you start to write hallelujah a hundred times or so, or uh, something else. And you find that um, actually God is helping you to use it to say your prayers. This week, we shift uh, away from the first word and we can, first of all, you can write whatever words of the 150th Psalm you want to, but on a weekly basis, we're particularly emphasizing one. This week, we're shifting to the first verse, praise him in his holy temple, praise him in the firmament of his power. And um, please do uh, look on the website for links to the instructions about how to make St. Mark's scrolls. When this project is over, we'll take all of our scrolls, they'll come back here to St. Mark's and we'll join them together in a lovely way um, so that we can uh, put the text of the 150th Psalm in all its component parts together and bring it together as one, uh, one work of praise. I want to tell you that um, yesterday a handful of us undertook the project of trying to um, restore a ministry of feeding on, on Saturdays since the soup pole has not been able to uh, function as, it, as it's intended to because it requires gathering people here. And a small handful of us made sandwiches in the parish hall under socially distant circumstances. And another handful of people with only a little bit of overlap uh, went and distributed those uh, on the streets of Philadelphia to those who, uh, who we could identify who were homeless and hungry. We were able to take about 100 bag lunches out yesterday. We'll continue to try to do this as long as the rate of infection stays um, under control here and it seems safe to do so and we, can, and we are able to um, practice the uh, appropriate social distancing in doing that. Um, it's, less, it's a less robust ministry than what we're accustomed to on Saturday mornings, but uh, we're still trying to, to meet the need of those who are hungry. Similarly, um, this week we'll be trying uh, to restore the food cupboard to its regular ministry in a modified plan, so again, to, to maintain social distancing. But we're aware that there are many people who are in need, and more people than ever, perhaps, in need at this time of pandemic. And we have resources to help them, and it's our, uh, our mission and our duty to do what we can to help. So we are uh, working to, with the ministry residents to make sure that we undertake that in safe ways so that we, it can be sustainable as well. Um, your prayers and your, um, your, your prayerful support for that ministry is uh, gratefully um, accepted. Finally, today is Mother's Day. And few of us can spend Mother's Day the way we would like to by um, saying thank you to our mothers and telling them that we love them. But before we continue with the Mass, I'd like to say this prayer for Mother's Day. Let us pray. Holy God, fount of wisdom, knowledge, and love, whose will it was that your son should be born of a human mother and nurtured in her arms. We give you praise and thanks for the gift of our mothers who brought us into this life. Bless, we pray you, our mothers, on this day. Give us grateful hearts for all that they have given us. Strengthen new mothers as they tend their children. Mend relationships that have been broken between mothers and their sons and daughters. Comfort those who grieve their mothers. Console those mothers who have lost their children. Attend to those children who have never known their mothers. Confirm by your grace the loving bonds that tether mothers to their children and children to our mothers. And help us all to rejoice in the gift of motherhood by the guidance and prayers of Mary, the mother of your son, and of us all, through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept.
thanks unto the Lord our God. Yes, yes, Sac 
sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with the ever-blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, with blessed Mark, the Evangelist, and with all your saints, into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask in your Son, Jesus Christ, by him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever.
body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The 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 God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of an everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.
Savior of the world, by your cross and precious blood, you have redeemed the world. Save, Save us and help us. We humbly beseech thee, O Lord. Let us pray. O most mighty and merciful God, in this time of grievous sickness, we flee unto thee for succor. Deliver us, we beseech thee, from our peril. Give strength and skill to all those who minister to the sick. Prosper the means made use of for their cure. And grant that, perceiving how frail and uncertain our life is, we may apply our hearts unto that heavenly wisdom which leadeth to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 